International Space Society. Thank you for joining our Space Forum this evening, Space Dreams, Then, Now, and Next, a conversation with Lori Garber. So we're really glad you're able to join us today for this Space Forum. We've been doing these since April, and they've been incredibly successful, and they've been successful because of you. So we thank you very much for your participation. I'd also like to welcome you on behalf of Larry Ahern, who is our Vice President for Chapters. These space forums are sponsored by both membership and chapters, and we look forward to many more to come. So this evening, I just wanna cover some space forum etiquette. If you do have a question, please submit it through the Q&A function, and those questions can only be seen by the panelists. I will let you know we received a lot of questions in advance. So I don't know if we'll be able to get to the questions that are submitted online today, but we'll try, we'll do our best. But please try to submit them if you get a chance. You can also use the chat function to comment, but I ask everybody to be respectful of the panelists and the audience in submitting your chat. So our agenda this evening, I'll do some initial introductions then we'll get into the speaker discussion and the Q&A, and then we'll wrap up with what's coming up next in terms of our Space Forum uh, plan. So our featured speaker today, as we said, is Lori Garber, and I'm gonna let our, one of our other panelists introduce her. So first, I would like to introduce uh, Dale Scran, who is chair of the National Space Society Executive Committee and he is going to do an introduction, and that will be followed by, he'll be followed by Jeff Lee Liss, who is hosting the tonight's event, who's an NSS Board of Directors member. So Dale, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Bert. I'm Dale Scran. I'm the chair of the executive committee, uh, like Bert said. Um, National Space Society is a, the leading citizen, not professional, not commercial, nonprofit that advocates for space development and settlement. NSS publishes Ad Astra Magazine and runs the annual International Space Development Conference. And we're the recognized leader in space settlement contests and competitions involving more than 10,000 students globally every year. So Lori is gonna cover a lot more of what NSS is from her experience, which is really extensive. I'm gonna leave more details to her, but first I wanna make a point about NSS that's not very well known. There are a lot of great things about NSS, but one that does not get a, little, a lot of public attention is our track record for incubating space leaders. For example, the former National Space Society Executive Vice President and Policy Chair Scott Pace is now the Executive Secretary of the National Space Council. The former NSS Executive Director George Whiteside, currently the Chief Space Officer of Virgin Galactic, was also Chief of Staff at NASA and CEO of Virgin Galactic for many years. And just within the very last month or so, we have seen NSS VP of Space Development, Greg Autry, appointed to be the NASA Chief Financial Officer. Which brings us to Lori. Perhaps the most successful NSS Executive Director of all, who has among many jobs, roles, and honors, received both the NASA Distinguished Public Service uh, Medal and the NASA Distinguished Service Medal, has had two epochs of working at NASA uh, most recently as Deputy Administrator, and most importantly, from the National Space Society point of view. And, and this is not to be taken lightly, because Lori has done many, many amazing things for the National Space Society uh, as Executive Director and in other roles. But she has used her position in NASA to advance the cause of commercial space, making her arguably the person outside of SpaceX most responsible for the success of commercial crew and the ongoing triumph of the commercial resupply services. It is really difficult to explain fully the depth and strength of Lori's contributions to our future in space. I could go on for much, much longer, but instead I would ask you to join me in welcoming Lori Garber to this forum. Welcome back, Lori. Thank you. Lori, it's always nice to see you. you know, I've known you since the early days of your involvement with, with Space Matters, and it's been a tr true pleasure to watch your career evolve. You know, you've been a real role model for so many people. Uh, tonight I thought with some simple things like, what are you doing right now? You're CEO of Earthrise Alliance. Can you tell us a brief bit about what that is? 
Sure. Well, hello, everyone. It's wonderful uh, to be with you this evening. I'm thrilled that more than 100 people signed on when Larry Ahern called me up a week ago and asked if I would do this. I figured it would be the be old home week. Perhaps it is, but I can't see you all. Um, uh, thank you, Dale, for that really wonderful introduction and Jeffrey to your question which yes it's wonderful to see you as well it's been 30 years um, since we started working together at least um, the Earthrise Alliance which I am CEO of is a small nonprofit going back to my National Space Society days where we utilize satellite data mainly imagery, uh, to identify climate change in a way that can be conveyed and accessible to a variety of people, journalists, educators, we have um, primarily, as well as uh, policymakers, local decision makers. We are, we exist because a family foundation um, asked first Jason Kessler, uh, to create such a thing, and then they recruited me a year and a half ago. Very good. You know, as we get into tonight's program on space dreams, then, now, and next, I might mention that later in the program, if we haven't already covered it, um, I hope to give you an opportunity to answer the question, if you were czar of the universe, what kind of space program would you have us have? But let's start with the then. Can you tell me, when did your interest in space start? Um, one of the things that I, I would say with the National Space Society, honestly, um, it, it really is my space home, uh, because although I grew up in the 60s, I believe largely because I was a girl, it was not something I really paid much attention to. I was eight when we landed on the moon, and although I remember it, and I think in my mind felt I would do it someday. It wasn't like I ever thought of it as a career. And when I worked for John Glenn on his presidential campaign, Alice Wilson, who was Glenn Wilson's wife, uh, told me she thought I should apply. I mean, it's just that simple. And the National Space Institute at the time uh, was four staff members. I was hired as secretary, bookkeeper, receptionist. And it has, so be, because of that, I really feel I learned everything about space, first from NSI and then when we merged from L5. Were there any particular high points to remember when you were involved with the National Space Society as executive director? So, many, all good. <laughs> so many high points. I have um, been writing a, a book mainly about commercial space and National Space Society plays a huge role in fundamentally providing the underpinnings of my views that, of course, lowering the cost of space transportation was the most important thing we could do for space development, but also giving me a community that truly believed in space development not because their jobs depended on it, but because it was the right thing to do. For me, over 13 years being in that environment shaped me. So overall, the most meaningful thing in my career has been those 13 years because from there, I went into an arena where most people had quite different views and they were there because their jobs depended on it. So they were towing a line of, of something that, um, there wasn't the conviction I know that we feel at NSS. So, of course, there were great highlights like the dinner honoring Apollo 13, either 20th or 25th anniversary. We happened, I just thought, well, they're making a movie. Let's call Universal Studios. Let's invite Tom Hanks. Tom Hanks came, Ron Howard came. We got to introduce, um, Tom Hanks to Jim Lovell for the first time. They hadn't even met. They, they're just pulling together the cast for the film. And because of that, I was able to get 
President Clinton to award the, I think it's the Presidential Medal of Honor to Commander Lovell, something that he told us at dinner that night he had never received. Tom Hanks talked to me after and said, I was watching you when he said that you're going to try and get in that medal, aren't you? I'm like, mm, sure. And he said, because if you do, I want to be there. <laughs> so I was like, wow, I'm definitely doing it now. Um, and we had a big event in Washington with Tom Hanks, who gave a speech at the Capitol right before that big vote on the space station. And it was just a wonderful thing. I think convinced a lot of people that we should be developing space. So just too many mention like this, but Tom Hanks. Me. The but of Tom course, Hanks that ISDC in Chicago was amazing. Well, I would agree with that, uh, having chaired it. Uh, if, um, you know, it might be worth, worth mentioning that both Tom Hanks and Jim Lovell are on our board of governors for National Space Society. Now, you know, you mentioned there's a big difference. What was it like transitioning from a nonprofit like NSS to a governmental entity? Uh, it was, a, it was a big difference. I came into NASA on the ninth floor, as they say. I had become familiar to the administrator, Dan Golden, at the time, and he recruited me to NASA because he had heard my testimony to the then first Augustine committee, to uh, the House and Senate, as we really pursued, I think, a policy for space and therefore NASA, partially, that was unique. And Dan Golden happened to be an administrator who felt he needed that type of thinking within the agency. So I did have the support of the administrator coming in. I was 36 years old at the time. I was not welcomed by everyone on the ninth floor of NASA, shall we say, as I having spent 10 years ago now, I'll think back, uh, the chief of staff at the time brought me in the first day and said, I, I told Dan not to hire you. I don't want you here. Never, ever are you going to be doing anything that involves strategy or anything important. And he tried to put my office as far away from the administrator as he could. That was a mistake because Dan found me off in a corner and then I, and then he pulled me up and gave me a really great office. Anyway, it was a rough, rough uh, start because people did not want our views on the ninth floor of NASA. You know, these were many of them former military. They intended to go back to industry. There's uh, a problem, I think, with the military industrial complex basically feeling that they own the space program and the people own the space program. And... I, I feel like going into NASA from the Space Society was positive in the sense that I didn't have to bring baggage, but it was a challenge, especially at first, to have our views be taken credibly. And I think as I was there longer and in more senior positions, that's when they really started to get nervous. <laughs> Would there be any warnings there for other people considering joining NASA or other governmental entities? Oh, I think NASA has changed. I think it's very much evolved. Of course, in any organization, there's a bureaucracy, certainly in large governmental organization, but fundamentally, as, as Dale mentioned, this shift has been transformative. And the kinds of things that the Space Society has been advocating for over 30 years are now seen as really basically what we should be going into space for. I remember a bit of a battle, but more a discussion right around the time of the merger for what our vision statement should be. Probably some of you were there. And you know, creating a space-bearing civilization came about as sort of a difficult thing for the old NSI people. Space pairing civilization sounded a little out there, but it wasn't long after that that President George H.W. Bush said it in his speech 
about the Space Exploration Initiative. And we had gotten to know the Space Council at the time. That was actually really helpful, I think, to our agenda at the Space Society and to Dan Golden noticing that our agenda was unique. The Space Council under Dan Quayle really had wanted to shake up NASA and that, that um, was why they got rid of the administrator at the time, Admiral Truly, and brought in Dan Golden. So that, that I think for people coming in now, there will certainly be different challenges but hopefully one of them isn't going to be, hey, we are doing this to open up the economic sphere for humanity and to be able to create a spacefaring civilization that will create communities beyond the Earth. I feel like I read recently that National Space Society has tweaked that statement a bit, but that was it when I was there. You know, it's a good segue from the old days to where we are now. In the old days, space meant NASA. Now there is Elon Musk at SpaceX, you know, and throwing a red roadster and a dummy astronaut into space was clearly very different. And there's Jeff Bezos and Blue Origin on the horizon. Uh, for those new to space matters, and without going into the book you're in the process of writing in great detail, uh, could you describe briefly what else is so different in space activities from even just five years ago? And why does that matter? Um, I guess my view is it has been a more of a progression than a revolution. I think, as I said, in the 80s and 90s, especially early, was not seen as um, a standard thing. But my time at NASA between 96 and 2001, Dan Golden had me meeting with commercial space transportation companies like Kistler and Rotary Rocket and Kelly. Uh, and we started a program called Alt Access and gave tens of millions, not hundreds of millions yet, to private sector to do that. Dan Golden wanted to turn over the keys of the space shuttle to the private sector back in the, in the mid 90s and the space station actually. Um, we started X33 that was going to lead to VentureStar, which would have been a commercial single stage uh, to orbit fully reusable transportation system and we thought we were getting it for a billion dollars. So one of the things that happened was SpaceX. I have to say there were these ideas and we really wanted them to work. We thought maybe Beale Aerospace would work but until that's I appreciate when Dale in the introduction said you know other than at SpaceX because yeah, we all had this idea well before SpaceX made it happen, but we needed somebody to step up. And I think even maybe equal to that, we needed competitors. And even during commercial crew, we had to keep making sure people selected two versus one um, service provider because ultimately this really is more about competition than who it is and that is what the private sector brings so we we i think have a lot of progress that we've made and it isn't revolutionary the things that are different are there are technologies that have been developed that have allowed the cost to be lowered there have been these couple of very wealthy individuals who have decided this is a good place for them to put their money so that they can be part of this grand and important vision. And all of that being supported by policy, which was really more my role uh, than the others, had to come together at the same time. And in some ways, I know lots of us are frustrated that it took so long. In other ways, you could, you could say, well, you know, I always felt it was inevitable. Most of you felt, taught me that. But it really um, was pretty, it's pretty exciting to be around right now where all those factors have come in together. For those who that, aren't familiar, for those who aren't familiar with it, could you describe briefly exactly, or not generally, how NASA now works with what we call the commercial space industry, things like commercial crew, public-private partnerships, what are all those things that we hear about? How NASA does them? How, what's your question? 
how does NASA work now with the commercial space industry? You know, we hear about commercial crew, sure. we hear about public-private partnerships. Exactly what are they for those who aren't familiar with them? Sure. Once again, I don't think it's a revolutionary approach. NASA has worked with the private sector since their founding in 1958, and like the military, has mainly purchased uh, their hardware and services uh, in a cost plus manner, which for an acquisition person, you recognize that means the requirements are set by the government, right? So the government likes that role. And for a lot of their work, especially in the early days, that was an appropriate role because we were trying new things and no private sector organization was going to take that risk. And NASA unfortunately got sort of used to setting the requirements even for things that now there really had become private sector willingness not only to invest but technologies that sometimes the private sector led to, to NASA for all the reasons that we know because capitalism has incentives that drive innovation and reduce costs and the commercial cargo and commercial crew just took advantage of a new procurement mechanism. NASA has the ability to do Space Act agreements. NASA has done them uh, for many purposes, primarily in very low investment amounts. I did with one with a space station um, experiment. What are they? What are Space, space Act agreements? agreements? What are they? It is a other transactional authority. I, I don't know anyone else who's really interested in this lawyer, Jeffrey. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Um, but yes, they are OTAs. I mean, I don't want to use jargon. You know, it's, it's a different way to procure a service where the requirements are not set by the government. So we like to think of this as, you know, we just sort of had to pry the government's hands off of a couple of areas of the programs that NASA held very dearly in order to allow these advances to be made and the cost to come down and in doing that allowing NASA to keep driving technologies further and you know we aren't quite there yet we're in the middle of a transition where we're sort of doing it both ways which frankly it's not sustainable uh, if we are spending the, oh, I think it's, I don't, more than $10 billion now on a bunch of cost plus programs for human spaceflight that actually in many ways do compete with the private sector companies who have put their own money into these systems. So it's, it's um, still got a ways to go. And I think NASA has turned, I, I wouldn't say turn the corner because most of the people within the agency still have a lot of questions about why it is they shouldn't be setting the requirements. Got it. As the alternative is that I understand it is that NASA simply will turn into a customer. They'll say, this is the product we want. And somebody give us an offer and then we'll make a deal for it. Is that the way it works? Well, people like to be concerned about that. That is just in no way a concern. If you look at NASA's now $23 billion budget, what they are doing in this um, arena is very small percentage. And most of astrophysics, heliophysics, uh, most of planetary science are things that NASA will be doing cost plus for quite a while. We have all kinds of um, undiscovered both technologies, capabilities that NASA should be driving. I think of it as if we were a you know, cycling in a peloton and we, the government should be riding point and that allows industry to be sort of drafting uh, from us to help. And if industry can come up in one particular area and take us, we don't pull out our uh, air pump and jam it in their spokes, you know, we take the next hill. And that there are so many next hills, NASA need not be concerned of, of letting go. And the more people realize that, and I think find and discover new things about um, 
what NASA could be doing. They'll be less concerned of letting go of this, but especially flying the astronauts is uh, the heart and soul of NASA. And so that was a pretty big challenge. You know, one last question on commercial space activities. There's been some discussion as to which federal agency should be the lead in regulating commercial space activities. The Federal Aviation Agency, AAA, or the Commerce Department, or which division of it, or some other agencies. Do you have an opinion on which one you think will end up with that responsibility, or which one you think should end up with that responsibility, or both? Well, ideally, they'd be the same thing. Uh, not, not NASA. I think it is a conflict to do both. Having worked in the commercial airline industry for five years before Earthrise at the Airline Pilots Union, um, it's very clear to me that the FAA plays a role that should be separate from, from really the development role. And I think for space transportation, FAA is the proper place for that. And I think there will be other aspects that Department of Commerce will be more suited for. And that is the path we are currently on. And I would not challenge it from what I uh, understand at this point. Well, one of the big topics of conversation in the space community is uh, the thing called the Space Launch System, also known as SLS, which has been under development since 2011 and is a successor of the Constellation Ares 5 proposal, which goes back all the way to 2005 and has been supported by multiple Congresses, multiple presidential administrations, and major corporate backing. Uh, could you describe briefly for the audience exactly what is that SLS program and what do you think will happen with it? And what do you think should happen with it? Uh, as you said, Jeffrey, the Space Launch System was created out of the ashes of the Constellation Program in Ares 5 in particular that was done by uh, the industry, people who wanted to build it, as well as the representatives of theirs in Congress, primarily in the Senate, um, and a big part of NASA behind the backs of at least me, <laughs> and the White House <laughs> and OMB. <laughs> so good for them. And they, that is, by the way, not supposed to be how it works in the government, you're part of the administration, you should not be fighting the administration's budget proposal that you are part of, note. Um, this program was dictated in the authorization bill that even said we had to keep the contracts that were already in existence. So shuttle contractors and Constellation contractors. So from its very beginnings, it was a jobs program. They mandated in the legislation that it fly by 2016. I remember telling Senator Nelson at the time that was highly unlikely. And he, that was very upsetting to him. And he said, no, we legislated it. <laughs> it's in the law. So well, you can pass a law that the sky is purple, but it doesn't make it so. Yes, good times. Um, the SLS has received funding. It was part of a negotiation because the, I don't know how many members of Congress, but at least the senators who were fighting for SLS, uh, they held the votes and they were not going to approve any funding that we re requested for a commercial crew program. So I refer to this often as our Faustian bargain because we made the deal. We would support SLS and Orion if they would support commercial crew as well as technology programs and earth sciences. Um, that deal was made in the summer of 2010. I recently wrote about it, um, a chapter in the book. And I've, I felt terrible about it. I just didn't think I just thought there was another way because the Democrats were in control of both the House and the Senate. It is a very long story. I won't get into much more. However, um, it's meaningful because that's how we got commercial crew. And a, a lot of times we would along the way just feel if we could get that camel's nose under the tent, that 
toe in the door before it slammed for the private sector, they would in fact outperform the government. And that is in fact what happened. If you think about it, if our, our budget proposal for commercial crew was $6 billion over five years. We started with requests of on the order of 500 million that were cut in half every year because in this grand bargain, we didn't set dollar amounts. Yet we followed what we said we would do and requested the money for SLS and Orion that the program said they needed. Congress took money from commercial crew and added it to SLS Orion. So here they started three times, four times, five times, six times bigger, got bigger and bigger, have not flown while SpaceX has flown. It is incredible that the, pu the public doesn't see this. Um, I will absolutely acknowledge that they have a, a different um, goal and architecture, you know, SLS is much larger rocket. Orion is capable of much more than Dragon. Um, but these are not comparisons that serve the government well for cost plus contracting because we spent tens of billions of dollars on those programs. And I, I don't know what is the future. Um, I think Jeff Greeson said it best. Um, the Augustine Committee in his report, he said, if we were given, and I, this must have been after Augustine because SLS came the next year. If we were given SLS, NASA couldn't afford to fly it. <laughs> so here we are, we weren't given it. Will has spent over 30 billion to get it. And it's still gonna be several billion a year, whether you fly it or not, which is what we were trying to get out of with the space shuttle. The, it is not only built on contracts that existed in the early 2000s, so nearly 20 years ago, it is based on space shuttle technology, which is from the 1970s. So is this a space program that you know, leads um, technology development? I, I, we can do better. And I believe that all the people who work on SLS and Orion are doing a fabulous job. And the people in these programs, I know it's hurtful for people like me, primarily me, to say these things. And so, to the extent I doubt any of them are on this call, but maybe watch later, the, the policymakers like me are the ones at fault. We held the responsibility to do this, not the people building the rockets and capsules. They are good people and they deserve to be given projects that really will um, take us to a space civilian civilization. You're not gonna do that at a couple billion dollars a launch, just not. That's a pretty important point. Um, there are a lot of people I know who are, who are on this program because I heard it was going to be special, who really have no idea what an SLS rocket is. Uh, could you describe very basically the difference, the main difference between an SLS and what they've only seen on television? They've seen Falcons, they've seen Starship, what is it, how is an SLS different from what they've seen? Well, an SLS is sometimes called the Frankenstein rocket. I think maybe Rick Tumlinson said that first. It was parts pulled from the shuttle and Constellation to keep contracts. So there is sort of that core external tank. Um, it has a configuration of two shuttle main engines versus three that justified several hundred million dollar investment in an upgraded ability to test those rockets, those those engines. Those engines were are all for the space shuttle that were supposed to be re reused and we're going to throw them away. This entire, um, and, and it has solid rocket motors, five segments versus four, with a capsule on top of uh, Orion. So it is, it will look like a combination of uh, sort of an expendable rocket or a Falcon Heavy with um, shuttle solid rocket motors on the sides, I think. I mean, they, the artistry has been magnificent since before, <laughs> before it was <laughs> born. Um, they painted it to look like a Saturn V in the posters that were brought to the Senate announcement that wonderful morning. <laughs> Now, I understand, though, the big difference between the SLS and what we've seen from SpaceX 
is you've got this big giant rocket which takes a long time to build and it's not reusable. It's thrown away when it's done. Is that correct? Yes, I said that. It is entirely thrown away. Well, they're, they're probably going to reuse the solids like they did in the shuttle. Okay. Um, let me, there are one of the other programs that NASA is starting to work on is the commercial lunar payload services. Um, what's your evaluation of that program, which is designed, I think, to build contracts for small lunar landers and lunar rovers? What do you think of that program? So I have um, good feelings about this program. I am not and have not been at NASA for my job for seven years, and I don't really actually follow it that closely. This is a program that seems uh, to, to be attempting to use some of the best uh, capabilities, uh, innovative commercial programs, but I, on, I honestly just don't know. Okay. We've seen a lot of media reports very recently that NASA's management of various projects has been called into question. Uh, are you able to describe the nature of the concern that's been expressed and what NASA's response to it was? Oh, and uh, if you have an idea what changes might be likely as a consequence of these inquiries? I assume uh, referencing GAO recent report, but the IG has also done some things lately, and these are tax dollars. And that is back to a very early question of yours about changing from National Space Society to NASA. I was always very cognizant at NSS that these were member dollars. And it's similar at NASA. I also got from the National Space Society 13 years this core belief that you had to provide value to your customers. And in my view, NASA customers are the taxpayers and to some extent their future, our future taxpayers. Um, so all kinds of reviews are quite, um, I think appropriately, used to evaluate how we are managing those dollars. Those programs, so you're always going to have those criticisms. I looked forward to our quarterly meetings with GAO anytime the IG was doing anything because these are fresh eyes on programs. You know, when you're running or number two at an agency with a $20 billion budget and 18,000 employees and another 20 some thousand contractors, you need to trust other people. And the secret, in my view, to any leadership success is getting good people and then trusting them. And the GAO, I will add OMB, we, we really, in this country, are very lucky to have people who can take very complex programs and follow them with an expertise to highlight where there are concerns. And we were very proud. I was proud during my time. I wasn't the person to get credit for it, but like our CFO and so forth, we're getting a lot of programs off of the critical management list. The reason NASA programs are often on this list is because of what I was saying about cost plus contracts and the government requirements. What unfortunately people at NASA feel that it is something they should be entitled to do are these programs instead of having that customer in mind? Why am I shipping this rocket for different um, states? Because I think it'll keep it sold. I think that will allow members to vote for this. I would always try to say, hey, let us handle that, that on the ninth floor. You build us the best rocket. You know, I was out looking at Orion in Denver. I remember they were going to ship it back to Cleveland and do their shake test there because we had just built a hundreds of million dollar shake test at Pumbrook. And then they said when they came back, they would put it in the uh, vacuum chamber again to check it. I said, well, why are we shipping it there then? And they said, oh, that's a NASA requirement. It has no reason to go there. This is Orion. If you look at the Webb telescope, they will, there's a map of the country and it hits like every state. These are all the states that contributed. They think that's a feature and I think it's a bug because if we are representing the public, we should run efficient programs. So one of the things that 
commercial companies do well is they drive efficiency. And that's what capital markets do. And if you don't, you don't survive. And I think we do need the GAOs and IGs and CBOs to do these reviews. And NASA often will set expectations to Congress that are much lower for the cost of these programs in order to get them sold. Shocking, I know. And then just ask for more money every year. And I, I would say sort of post Apollo, I think five presidents have mandated that we take the next hill, you know, whether it was moon, in our case, asteroid, that's a different story. And now moon again, it's been Mars before. Um, we keep expecting something different's going to happen. And that is the definition of insanity because we're doing the same thing. So we should try to do something different. Well, hope speaks to eternal but um speaking about thinking about things forever that aren't happening can we talk a bit about space-based solar power also known as ssp for those who for those who are new to the term that would involve orbiting satellites transmitting solar power to receiving stations on earth reducing the need for fossil fuels um, and we've been talking about that for years we've had experiments that seem to show that transmission through the atmosphere is possible so I'm wondering, what are your views on SSP and what do you think the U.S. should be doing or not doing with respect to it? Uh, I think also going back to my National Space Society days, I have felt this was an important part to any space architecture uh, because we would maybe, yes, in the early days, I don't think it was as much seen as a get off fossil fuel um, capability more, a space colony power uh, ability. And anything that has more than one, you know, use like that, a dual purpose mission, that is the kind of thing that I feel if NASA were truly doing advanced technologies, this would be the kind of thing they would take on. You, you say we've done it, we've done very little. Unless is that that's something that I am unaware of. To your knowledge, is that is SSP something that is um, that NASA is not that interested in, or that Congress is not that interested in that NASA would like to do more? My cynical view is that because of the military-industrial complex, but it is more complex than that. Um, <laughs> NASA does primarily repeat things. Dan Golden called it the giant self-licking ice cream cone. I think he <laughs> got that from Pete Warden, however. And it refers to sort of the relentless momentum of the status quo. So if you are seen as a jobs program and the committee chairs are in this because of jobs and contracts in their districts, then they are the ones who are going to only advance programs that fit their infrastructure and their workforce. So it is very hard to break out and do something new because there are not advocates for it. We found this extremely challenging to overcome because getting a new start is really tough when people don't wanna let anything go. So one of the great things I will say about uh, our time right now seems to be the administration and to a lesser extent, but a little bit Congress is willing to increase the budget. So they haven't let go of the status quo things, but that's at least allowed them to get some more things started. And that could be a really good way to get more camel's noses under the tent to get some things going that um, will outpace the status quo enough that more people will notice. And I, I think this is fundamentally that NASA should be reaching more people than just the handful of, of members of Congress and the companies who make money on these contracts because otherwise you're just gonna be doing the same thing. So where is the SPS other than the National Space Society um, advocates who have 
a meaningful constituency that can get a program started. That's a, that's a tough thing. One of the things that's puzzled me, and you with the Earth Alliance might be able to appreciate this, is the total lack of either interest or even awareness of SSP among climate groups. I'm wondering why you think that is or what we might be able to do to get them on board because it seems our interests are very much aligned. I think that is worth pursuing. I am less familiar overall with the environmental groups. I remember in the early NSS days when people spun off different organizations like the Space Frontier Foundation and so forth and wanted me to be upset about it. I said, oh, no one ever complains the environmental, there's too many environmental groups. Like, let's be as you know, effective as them. And if that takes more organizations, that's fine. But I have, um, I, I believe that focus on conservation and things that they feel they can more meaningfully do have led the, um, the group's motivation so far. But I think it's completely worth doing. Now people are talking about these geoengineering solutions and um, that probably should be put in the mix. Probably a good agenda for NSS. Would you say it's fair to say that the arrival of, a, of new generations of reusable rockets will make space solar power more, much more feasible than it had been thought to be? I do. I think it makes everything more possible than, than we thought. That was, that was the point. Um, it is ironic to me that our space program has primarily been dictated in sort of a Soviet style when NASA was basically formed to show democracy and capitalism were the best ways to advance science and technology. Uh, so here we are trying to dictate, we will you know, plant the potatoes in March. It's crazy. What we needed to do, which is so excitingly happening now, if you can reduce the cost, was that Heinlein? You all will know, you know, get low Earth orbit, you're halfway to anywhere. Um, the, the people will figure out things to do that are of value in space because they are going to cost so much less to test them out. In, in 2011, we launched more satellites than we had launched since 1958 to 2011. Like it's advanced so many multiples because of this reduction in not only transportation costs, but the size of satellites, the capability of satellites, our ability to model and store and access data. Like we aren't the only ones, you know, technology marches on and innovation are, are gonna make more and more things available to be done in space that are meaningful. So let me go back to NASA for a moment. Uh, so, so we do it relatively briefly. I was wondering, how does NASA work? What is its internal process in evolving the policies and programs it recommends to the president? How does that get done? I'm sorry, I was trying to read the comments. Which programs to recommend to the president? No, in, ge in general, how does NASA decide among itself which policies and programs it recommends to the president? What's its internal process? Or is that too complicated for tonight? Oh, no, well, I'll, I'll try and simplify it. No, my, my um, reaction is more that it's, it's not ideal, you know, <laughs> like so many things in government. Um, I was just shocked. The, and I didn't find this out in my first tour of NASA because it's, it's a process that only a few people participate in, but it starts, I wish I could do a vote on this Zoom call, um, in legislative affairs. So speaking of, you know, the problems, uh, Ledger Affairs brought Charlie and I this list of policy agenda for, for us to put forward. And there were like six items and they were just silly things that the Hill wanted. Uh, the, oh, this will make so-and-so happy. I'm like, well, when do we come up with our own? And no one ever wanted us to. You know, the process is the process. Uh, this is this is what happens. I, gosh, probably Charlie wanted by the end to strangle me every time I did it. But someone would say, "No, that's NASA policy." To to he and I, and I would look at him like, "You know, you set NASA policy, right? Like, please do not hide 
behind this. Um, but the typical thing is to do just that because you won't get in trouble and there is no benefit to it other than you know you're doing your job um i really think that the process hopefully it's changed in since then but it started in legislative affairs and unless someone like me really wanted to bend their pick on a new policy it uh came from the hill well i think you may have answered the question i was going to ask next was in general to what extent does NASA feel free to push for its own best recommendations of how to best achieve the exploration of space and putting humans there? In other words, if we were, so to speak, to unleash our NASA scientists and engineers to best pursue the goals of NASA's statutory origin, how different would their recommendations be from policies pursued by various Congresses and administrations? You know, how much of what NASA people really believe ends up in the directives NASA is ultimately given? And I guess the answer is not much. No, it depends on who you say is NASA. Because okay. I would say the majority of NASA gets what they want because those people on the seventh floor were in lockstep with- I was thinking, of the, I was thinking more of the scientists and the engineers. How much did they- Yeah, get yeah. Well, I mean, there are 18,000 of them. So there's not a sole voice. And I often found a lot of support for my ideas and our administration's ideas from those scientists and engineers and found it you know refreshing and of course most people go into this field because uh they truly believe it is something important to do with their lives and their careers so giving them that important thing i took seriously and i i think what has happened is it becomes more about um, what you know you've done before and what the companies that you are comfortable with can do with you. And it is hard to take risks in government. So you know how effective we were at having a space exploration program that we thought was more meaningful. I guess I I have I have. Ben, as I said, really, I was very disappointed that more of our initiatives didn't get through, but the one that did was the primary one, and that's why we fought for it and protected it at all costs, and it costs a lot, but it probably was the right one to do. It seems to me from the outside that this administration is having more impact, again, probably by getting more money at having a human spaceflight program that they want. You know, yes, they're still funding SLS and Orion, and both the administrator and the president have sort of tried to distance from it a, a little. Um, but saying enough that keeps Congress on board, and then going off and doing new things and allowing others to compete. So I think it's working uh, better, which I which I think is wonderful. One of those reasons is we've had some retirements of some of the members of Congress who were the most, uh, there's one or two left, but you know, the most just in it for their uh, constituencies. And by the way, that's their job and it's industry's job to lobby for this stuff. So I really don't want to at all be as critical of that system. I am most critical of the positions like I was in and the policymakers not being able to convey the importance of doing things differently and take those messages to the public who pay for the agency. And I think that responsibility is unique and not very many people have it and we should be doing a better job when we're in those jobs. And but I think we're doing a decent job now. On July 23, the White House National Space Council issued a report called The New Era for Deep Space Exploration and Development. If you had, had a chance to look at it, I wonder if you have any thoughts on it. I did look at it. I don't think I read the whole thing, but what I read just sounded fantastic. Well, that's I, crazy. I, like there were, I mean, they talked about sustaining humans in space, right? Sustaining mm -hmm. humanity. Wasn't that a good thing? That's a good thing. 
Let me ask you this about Congress. How, in general, I, mean, I didn't read down to the, you know, the Space Force or those things. But no, I mean, I, I in general think these policy directives have been positive. Scott Pace is writing them. I learned everything I know from Scott Pace. Who is who is Bill Mitchell, or former executive vice president of National Space Society? Oh, first I learned it from Glenn Reynolds. It's Glenn it's, Reynolds. You know, it's really nice to see space advocates on both sides of the political fence. You on the one side, Scott on the other. It's, it's very encouraging. But I have a general question. Uh, in How partisan or nonpartisan are space issues in Congress? I've been saying for years that they are parochial, not partisan. That's not exactly true. They are more parochial than partisan. Unfortunately, the whole country's become more partisan and I did find it was hard for us to get Republican support for programs that very clearly should be supported by Republicans, even if they didn't have space in their district. So they, they just wanted to be against the president. And I'm sure that's happening now. So there is some partisan aspect to this. And there always has been. Um, well, speaking of partisanship, as I understand it, Republicans reportedly are readopting their 2016 platform, which according to my word search, does not even mention space. The Democrats draft platform says they are, quote, committed to continuing space exploration and discovery, unquote. Uh, many space advocates have um, found that language is studiously ambiguous. And that while there's a later reference to return Americans to the moon and go beyond to Mars, there's no mention of sustained space development in cislunar space or space settlements sustained or otherwise. And for those who know, cislunar space is basically anything between the Earth and the Moon. Uh, so if the Democrats regain power, what do you think their attitude will be towards sustained space development and settlement? Uh, I don't think we know yet. I, I believe that certainly at the time, Vice President Biden was completely on board with and supportive and advocating of our plan, which was just that, sustaining uh, space um, settlements. We don't have, I, you know, any, any indications, anything has changed. And I would doubt that can't say for sure because I truly do not know if he's read that Democratic platform statement or not. But I, I wouldn't read too much into it other than it is very much allowing those decisions to be made in the future. And I do not believe in any way that you would expect someone who was vice president during a time when much of these programs got started to do anything other than double down on them. That is, I, let I me ask you, let me, would, let be, me ask you, would be different than the past. Okay. Let me ask you, uh, switching gears for a moment as we get toward the end of our time, and I know that we're able to extend it a little bit, which I'm glad for. Um, at this time, what would be your own personal pet space project, human or robotic, or one of each, if political considerations and costs, well, at least reasonable costs were not relevant factors. Would you like to see a volcano in Io? Would you like to do a submarine in Titan's atmosphere? Or what would you be your one pet project if you could do that? If any. I, I am pretty excited about Europa, personally. Uh, I do, and way before Congressman Culbertson was, but there, he probably was for the same reasons we were when we started discovering the icy moons. It was extremely exciting. Um, I do tend to continue to be, who isn't, fascinated by Mars. It's most Earth-like. It's a potential for us. Um, but if you're saying robots versus humans, I don't know where to put that immediately. I would still send robots until the time humans are going. I think the moon is very likely and should be the first step before Mars and have felt that way unless there was some amazing technology that came in and uh, made Mars somehow easier and cheaper. But if you're anyone who's in, 
interested in advancing civilization and sustaining humanity, you have to go in a way that is affordable and uses in situ resources and develops in a way that will be um, able to be sustained. And that isn't necessarily the government's job. I think robotic space missions, as well as I'm always been interested, as I think most people are, in SETI and our abilities now with Kepler and looking at Earth like planets, I think is just incredibly fascinating. And our study of the sun, I loved it when we called that program Living with a Star, as it relates to our Earth and our atmosphere. And Earth science, truly, I mean, I, I have looked back because of the research for the book at lots of what we wrote in the NSS days, and again, credit to people who actually did the writing more than myself. Uh, we always included Earth. It was never an either or. And I think you have both Elon and Jeff Bezos having this vision off planet as inspired by sustaining humanity in a way that keeps them from you know just being a single planet species and that used to be something very um th that wasn't said very often and i credit mike griffin for instance with saying this a lot of people have said this more recently and it is a very credible credible thing uh, to be doing so i'm most inspired by those types of missions but i love the science as well anything that really reaches i think recognition for humanity not just the taxpayers because we share our discoveries with everyone it really reveals the unknown I love discovery. I do not like it when we keep repeating the same things. That's not what NASA's for. So this sort of gets right back to the big question I mentioned at the very beginning, which you've sort of addressed. But if you were to step back and, uh, you know, for private industry, there's not much we can do except have laws and regulations that make it conducive for private industry to do the things they want. But from looking at it from the, what the, our government can do, if you were the NASA administrator, the president of the United States, the Speaker of the House, the president of the Senate, and to borrow a phrase from NSS's former chair, Professor Glenn Reynolds, you were also czar of the universe, all rolled into one, and not having to consider politics. What sort of comprehensive, long-term space policy, beginning now, would you personally prescribe for the United States? And feel free to be as detailed or as not as you want. You are czar. You wave your magic wand. This is what we're going to do starting tomorrow. It's a very unrelated question, and yes. I feel like my expertise that is most uh, valid is how we manage to do all that within the reality of the situation. However, uh, I think as I very much align with what I said, I would drive the um, civilization to new knowledge, revealing the unknown. I mean, I was really proud of rewriting the NASA mission. I was there, vision statement, to re reach for new heights and reveal the unknown so that what we do and learn will benefit all humankind. And benefiting all humankind includes no boundaries, right? And I don't know, I still watch Star Trek <laughs> and I find the latest version incredibly inspiring. That, you know, I got to, know Gene Ronberry at NSS a little bit and it's hard to imagine that wasn't even the first highlight I thought of when you asked me. His vision is mine. If we could truly peacefully have humanity exploring and settling in space and doing that in a way that showed our humanity and our equality and justice, that would be a wonderful thing. Yes, yes, very good. There's a few more questions. You know, NAS National Space Society's vision, which you'll find on our website, nss.org, is people living and working in thriving communities beyond the earth and the use of the vast resources of space for the dramatic betterment of humanity. So I'm wondering, for an organization like this, what's the best way for space advocates, like members of the National Space Society, to influence government space policy? 
What can we do? You know, it has evolved. When I was at NSS, we had some very rudimentary tools like the phone tree that we used uh, effectively, in, in my view. I know that before me, the L5 Society developed the phone tree and used it to influence things like the US position on treaties, keeping us from signing the Moon Treaty. Um, we worked very hard using those tools to get the Space Exploration Initiative um, to be funded back in the late 80s, early 90s, not successfully. But interestingly, those tools sort of have become, of course, no one uses the phone anymore, and the ability to flood offices with emails I, I think it's probably a decent thing to do, but being the thought leadership behind a lot of these ideas is where NSS has really excelled. I'm not sure they've been given proper credit for that, which is fine. It's not all about the credit, but there are a lot of space groups out there that have gotten big and seem to believe they are you know, leading the charge. And I really believe that having the National Space Society that produced, as you have said, people in these positions uh, like Scott and George and myself and lots and lots of others who've started companies and so forth. It's, it's people, right? It's, uh, I used to say at NASA, these rockets don't build themselves. It is about people and the National Space Society touching people's lives in a way that allows them to make their own unique contribution, whatever it is, to the grand vision, I think is important. And the statement that, that you just read, it'd be important to get that out more because not everyone who is employed in the aerospace arena is as in touch with that, that core universal draw to space and the reasons that we go. And we get mired in the politics and the hardware. And I think, frankly, the reason I have been, uh, had, had a career as I have is because I held this different perspective. And the context of space is rarely thought of at NASA because they're so busy doing these amazing, you know, exquisite, uh engineering it's like well let's you know lift lift our heads up and national space society helps us do that and, and i think the more you are able to do it in ways that influences not just the people who are in the field but those taxpayers who you just might touch touch people in a way that makes them want to be involved, whether they want to work in it or not. I will use this occasion to talk about the Brooke Owens Fellowship uh, organization. I co-founded with, with two colleagues a few years ago when a dear colleague passed away at the age of 35. And having her life be able to inspire more women and gender minorities and more minorities and people who don't typically see themselves in this field is going to be a game changer for space development. We went to the moon with white men who were, they looked very much alike. They were very much the same backgrounds and diversity adds strength. And that does that in nature as well as in any collaborative effort in teams. It is still shocking to me how little diversity there is in our field. And I think National Space Society, you've seen some things you've written. I know you have an interest in, in doing more. And I think communicating in a way that is less about the what and more about the why is a way to have people recognize this is not just their grandfather's space program. You know, I have to ask one cautionary note on this. Um, what are the, because we can get very enthusiastic in the space community, sometimes over enthusiastic. 
what are the most ineffective or even backfiring ways that space advocates sometimes try to influence uh, space policy? Is there anything we should avoid doing? Of course. I mean, I remember uh, missteps as well. Although, you know, it's interesting at the time you might be upsetting people, but oftentimes they, they maybe think back and well, that was okay to do. Um, I know the Space Society, uh, you know, broke some China in the early days when I was there and that ended up being the right thing to do. So I hate to reel anyone in, honestly. Um, and as I said, we, we were first to bring a lot of what's happening now. Um, mistakes. I, I don't know. You, you're public citizens. You should be able to convey what you think is meaningful. Um, I recently, I, I don't know when this book is coming out, was someone was talking to me about Europa and the early days of trying to get Ulysses and Galileo flying. So they were using um, RTGs, you know, these uh, nuclear propulsive devices. And Jeremy Rifkin had filed a motion to stop the launches. And this was the one who wrote an amicus brief, which is like a public um, difference of opinion legally. You could explain an amicus brief better, Jeffrey, but my experience uh, was in delivering this National Space Society amicus brief to counter Jeremy Rifkin and his followers on the district uh, courthouse steps. This must have been in the 80s. Um, and we won. And that was an influential thing to have done because it needed to show there was public that supported taking this very, very minute risk, right? So those are the kind of things you can look for that, that NSS uniquely has the ability to do. And I think developing relationships with people at NASA who understand our role at the Space Society, it was very important for me to have had this background because I count on people. And I, I mean, there were just so many times when I reached out to my community at the Space Society, probably many of you on line over the years because I couldn't do something in my role, but I knew it needed to be done. I'd call you my kitchen cabinet and be that kitchen cabinet for whoever's in charge because uh, they, there will always be those people who appreciate a, a public, I think non self-interested organization. I regret that I'm going to have to pass up the next hour full of questions. I'm going to conclude with one comment that a registrant wrote in, not a question, but I think she speaks for us, or he or she speaks for us all. And the comment was, thank you for your service and the many tasks that you've taken on. We all appreciate it. And I really appreciate your time tonight. And I'm now going to turn this, oh, well, two things. A reminder, anybody who wants more information about National Space Society, they can just go to our National Space Society's website, which is either nss.org, or if it's easier to remember, space.nss.org. And now I'll give turn over a final word from Dale Scran, the chair of National Space Society's executive committee. Thanks again, Lori. Always You're good welcome. Thank you. I read through um, all the nice comments. Thank you. Oh, go ahead, Lori. No, I'm just reading through the comments and responding. Okay. Um, Look, I'll be extremely brief. Um, I'd just like to uh, thank Lori for, for being here. It's been a wonderful talk. I learned a lot, and I hope everybody else did. Um, we, maybe we can welcome you back at some point in the future, and we wish you the very, very best in your career as it unfolds. So um, the, the, the final thing, I, and I, I, I feel I've, I've made a sort of a mistaken plan here. I, it was my intention to make a pitch for – everybody making a contribution to the uh, Gerard County of Voyager Circle program, which is uh, you make a contribution and then you put NSS in your well. And I was going to show off my wonderful O'Neill blazer, which I'm wearing right here. You can see it on me. And I like to use car salesman. I intended to lift up my jacket and I, I guess you can see it. 
but with the, the curious uh, way these backgrounds work, you, you can't actually clearly see it. I'm like the invisible man. But uh, they do have the wonderful uh, O'Neill images on the inside, and everybody who joins the program gets it. So if you want to find out more about that, go to nss.org uh, slash uh, donations. And that's nss.org slash donations, and you can find information there. Uh, and if for some reason you don't particularly like this program, we actually have the ability, which we've added since Lori's time, to donate to specialized funds, you know, education, advocacy, uh, space settlement, or to the general fund. So uh, really thank you for all your support. And I, again, thank Lori from the bottom of my heart for everything she's done. And I, my only regret is that I was unable to help her more when she needed help. So thank you. Uh -huh. Now, seriously, I don't know. I mean, there were over 100 people, and um, I know it's beyond time, but I can't, I can't really say enough how NSS has, I, you're my family, and I grew up because of you, and you should take a lot of pride in what you have done. So um, right back at you. Thank you. Hey, everybody, this is Bert again. And as we get close to signing off, I also want to thank Lori so much for a really informative discussion tonight. And I don't know, Lori, if you remember, we first met back in 1985 at the launch of STS uh, 61C. Uh, it got down to 14 seconds. And I was there on an NSI tour with you. And <laughs> but I also got yeah, to meet those, you. Those were really, really important early experiences. You know, oh, it's, it's shocking how how much when you're doing those things, you don't realize how much you're really learning. At the oh. a, after that, at the accident, I was there with a you know shuttle launch tour at 51L Challenger, and that changed it all. Yes, oh, wow. yeah. but it was also great to see you. Uh, I'm a volunteer at the Intrepid, and I was there when you came with the uh, the Enterprise and also the STS-135 crew. So. So thank you so much for being here tonight. We really appreciate it. I also want to thank Jeffrey Liss for doing a great job of hosting and moderating and answering those, asking those questions. And also shout out to Larry Ahern, who's doing an amazing job booking all the speakers for the space forums and town halls, and to Fred Becker, who's helped me uh, monitor them each time. So again, thank you all. And thank you, Dale, also for uh, your introductions and your talks about uh, NSS. So I want to just share my screen one more time to just talk about what's coming up next. Uh, so let me do that right now. And if we can get this to advance, there we go. So next week we, uh, we have the case for space-based solar power with John Mankins, uh, one of our NSS board of directors. But also I apologize to uh, Lieutenant Colonel Pete Garrison, retired USAF, who is also going to be uh, speaking with John uh, talking about space-based solar power. I didn't have that information when I made the slide. So, so we're looking forward to another really informative space forum. I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight. We had a great turnout, and we're going to be sending out the recording for those who might have missed it. We hope you can join us again next week. And I just want to say to everybody, stay, out, stay safe. Uh, the weekend's coming up, so have a great weekend. And for those of you tonight, have a good night. And for those of you who are in tomorrow already, uh, wishing you a great day ahead. So take care, everybody. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Nice to talk to you. Okay.